Hi, I'm Stuart Spinks, and welcome to episode 302 of my podcast, Beekeeping Short and Sweet. At this time of the year, there's just no let-up. It's a huge growth period for our colonies. We're still trying to calm the urge for colonies to swarm, and I've been carrying out more shook swarms to remove old, dirty combs, and with luck, any hidden varroa population. Beekeeping Short and Sweet, a beekeeping podcast for the inquisitive beekeeper with a short attention span. A beekeeper, in fact, just like me. This week's podcast is sponsored in part by Modern Beekeeping, suppliers of general beekeeping equipment, including high-density poly hives. These include Paradise National Hives, Swenty Poly Hives, and of course, Honey Pour Hives, my particular favourite. More than this, modern beekeeping also supply traditional cedar and pine hives, a range of very effective bee feeds called Appy Mix and Appy Pasta, and a full range of all the must-have beekeeping equipment for every beekeeper. For all your beekeeping needs, contact Paul at Modern Beekeeping by visiting their website www.modernbeekeeping.co.uk. Hi everyone, welcome back to another weekly dose of what feels like slightly out of control mayhem right now. I'm going to blame the weather this week. The sometimes settled weather that we've had recently has given way to highly unsettled weather with some very sharp showers preventing inspections on several days last week. This current weather pattern seems set to continue for at least the next week, possibly longer. It does mean we need to get some food onto our shook swarm colonies, as any long periods of wet weather will prevent the bees getting out to forage, and that will delay the all-important building of fresh comb on the foundation we've placed in these new frames. One of the very best reasons for a shook swarm is that opportunity to get rid of all the frames in a brood box in one hit. A chance to halt the development of any pests and diseases that might have taken hold and a chance for the bees to build lovely new comb with plenty of room for the queen to lay eggs in. I've carried out quite a number of shook swarms in the last week or two. We had quite a lot of old frames, some very old frames, along with some pretty nasty looking brood comb. Not diseased, you understand. Just misaligned and being built in all sorts of different directions. So I guess not really that old, but well used. And some of the hives had that wax drawn out in awkward directions, just making it tricky to remove the frame without ripping open any sealed sections of stores or damaging freshly capped brood. This is where a little care is required when you fix the wax foundation into these frames in preparation for swapping them out. It needs to be held firmly to the frame where the top bar wedge is nailed back in and the wax foundation wants to hang down nice and straight, free to move a little once the bees clamber all over it. I think what some beekeepers don't realise is just how heavy a frame fitted with a sheet of fresh wax foundation weighs once it's covered with honeybees. The wax warms up and can move and stretch a little. If the bottom of the wax sheet isn't free to move, then it can buckle and twist, causing it to bow. When the bees finally get to that section to draw out new comb, They don't think about what the beekeeper wants, they simply create the cells to the shape of any curve or bend in that foundation. I've used many different types of frame over the years, National, Commercial, and now of course Langstroth. The National and Commercial frames have a groove in the sidebars for the wax foundation to sit in. When you slide the foundation into the frame as you make it, This groove guides the wax and prevents it wobbling around. The sheet, in most cases, slides through the two bottom bars and again is held freely to allow a little bit of movement. When it's placed in the hive, the bees climb onto it and go to work producing new comb. 
these frames with their free to move and wobble wax foundation will give a little and with a little bit of luck you'll get nicely drawn out flat comb that has usable cells across the entire frame just what you want with the Langstroth frames there are no grooves in the sidebars and for me we have wired frames rather than wired foundation. This means we heat up the wires with the foundation touching it and the wax melts onto the wires and is held in position securely. The big challenge here is to make sure that the wires are tight and the wax firmly attached. The reason for this is any movement in the wires means the wax will sag and if the wax sags it normally drops down onto the bottom bar and causes a little bend in the wax. This in turn means the bees draw the comb with that curve and it can make for some awkward little gaps where not only the queen can hide but queen cells can be hidden. So the moral of the story is Take your time when you're waxing or re-waxing your frames and it will pay dividends in ways you might not suspect long after the frame has been placed in the hive and you've forgotten about the time you sat at the workbench fitting sheets of wax to frames in the late winter months. While I've been inspecting colonies this last week I've noticed a few frames where I didn't take as much care as I should have and the wax has that telltale curve at the bottom. It made it a little awkward to spot queen cells and in some instances trying to find the queen but actually it isn't too tricky and the easiest solution is to shake the bees off the comb, take a sharp knife and cut a horizontal line of comb away from the bottom where the curve begins. The bees quickly repair the damaged comb and I'm left with nicely straightened comb. That's the benefit of horizontally wired frames too. If the frames had been wired vertically or in a zigzag pattern, I couldn't have done this. When I was able to get out to inspect the colonies, I still found some wanting to swarm. Queen cells loaded with a puddle of royal jelly is a sure sign that there's a young larvae hidden inside being developed to become a new queen. These are removed and we hope that it's enough to convince our colonies to give up attempting to swarm. It doesn't always work though and we'll find the next week there are more queen cells. A couple of points to mention here. Firstly, and thinking back to my comments about having straight comb in the frames, colonies are very adept at hiding queen cells, especially if you keep knocking them down. The second point I wanted to mention is that if you keep knocking back queen cells on very determined swarmy colonies, they will eventually win the battle, especially if they have older comb. They have a knack of hiding queen cells somewhere that you'll never ever find. I use a three strikes and you're out technique to manage these colonies. That's to say, if they're trying to produce swarm cells for three consecutive weeks, I will, on that third week, remove the queen to a nuke box and let them produce a new queen. It's handy keeping the old queen around for a while, just in case the new queen fails to mate properly. If she becomes a drone-laying queen, you do then still have the fallback of the old queen that you can reintroduce and not end up with a hopelessly queenless colony. This is particularly useful if you don't have many colonies and losing one to a drone layer hits harder than if you have lots of hives. Just thinking back to the shook swarm process, part of the technique is to place a queen excluder between the brood box and the floor. This is intended to stop the queen from absconding with most if not all of the colony. It works well for the most part, and with all of the shook swarms we've carried out this spring, I was kind of anticipating at some point we might suffer an absconding colony, and sure enough, we suffered one just last week. It does appear to be equipment failure that was the cause, so I guess that translates into beekeeper lack of attention, because what I found on closer inspection of the near-empty hive was the wire queen excluder had a slight kink in one of the wires, and it looks as if it left a wide enough gap for the queen to squeeze through. 
I do prefer wire queen excluders rather than the old galvanised slot ones or the more recent plastic style. I find these tend to spring off the brood box when I'm trying to peel it away and that in turn throws bees into the air and with some of the more fractious colonies that's the last thing I want to have happen. So with a total of maybe 15 to 20 shook swarm colonies I reckon having one get away from my attention isn't so bad after all. Talking of bees getting away from us, one of our collected swarms decided it didn't like its new home. I was in the apiary at the back end of last week and thought the hive looked a little quiet. Sure enough, they were gone. It's another one of those beekeeping mysteries. Why do most swarms take to their new hives without any issues at all, yet some, for what appears to be no reason at all, decide they don't like it and disappear over the nearest hedge? The good news is that it wasn't the monster swarm at the farm apiary. That one has grown into three fully drawn brood boxes. Foundation throughout and it's all completely drawn. Very nice indeed. I actually intend using all of this freshly drawn brood comb for split colonies. We'll keep the queen and most of the flying bees in one hive, but take out maybe half of the brood frames, leaving her with five frames of foundation for her colony to continue to draw. The other frames will be split into five frame nukes, and these will go on, hopefully, to be the basis for some of our colonies to take to the heather moors in August. I really want to have everything prepared and colonies as strong as possible for both the borage and the heather this year. We've been able to hold on to a fairly decent crop of spring honey too, despite all of the challenges with swarming, so it's been a good start despite the tricky weather conditions. This next week sees the start of preparations for the first batch of new queens coming to us from Northumberland Honey. Over the years, I've had varying success with introducing queens into queenless nukes or splits or even full-size colonies. It hasn't really mattered on the size of the colony or the box I'm using. I always seem to get it horribly wrong and would lose the odd queen or two. In more recent times, we've hit on a method that works really well for us and fits in nicely with the way we work our colonies at the end of the spring flow and into the June period prior to taking the bees to the borage or the first flush of blackberries coming into flower at the fishing lakes. As an aside, I saw a couple of blackberry patches in flower yesterday at the fishing lakes, so here in particular there's unlikely to be a June gap this year. Anyway, these new queens that are heading my way need me to get organised so we have a successful introduction. This is how I do it, and last year it was very successful for me. The queens have been on order for some time now. I've arranged a specific date to aim for with Luke, and if the weather plays ball, we should be able to hit that date. I'm about a week away from that first specific delivery date, so what I do is double brood those colonies I want to split and this gives me not just more frames of brood but also nice new comb drawn out by the bees over the last couple of weeks. So what we have is a hive with two brood boxes on it and maybe one or two supers. The hive is split down and I inspect the colony to find the queen. She goes into the bottom box with the frames containing mostly eggs and young larvae. The sealed brood and older larvae goes into the top box, but I split the two boxes with a queen excluder, preventing the queen from going back up into the top box and laying more eggs. The larvae in the top box should therefore be too old to turn into queen cells once split into a queenless setup. A week after this process, the top box is removed and placed on its own floor and moved to another part of the apiary. The older flying bees head back out to forage and go back to their original hive position, leaving mostly nurse bees in the queenless box tending the larvae and sealed brood. This colony is now what we term hopelessly queenless, meaning they can't make a queen from any of the larvae that they have. On the day of introducing the new queens, I carry out one final check 
to look for any queen cells that may have been created. That always seems to be an odd frame with larvae young enough that the bees attempt to produce a queen, and any of those queen cells that we find are knocked down. The queen inserted in her cage and allowed to be released by the bees. I'd like to say it's foolproof, but there always seems to be one or two that catch me out occasionally, but that's beekeeping, isn't it? So, a few more weeks of crazy busy times, and then hopefully it will begin to settle down a little. Oh, I talked about the Oz armour suit last week. Well, I stupidly forgot to change the fencing style veil to the round hat style veil, and got stung on both ears for my troubles. I've changed it now, so we'll see how things go from here on. Look out for the new style veil in the weeks to come in all of the videos that we create. Well, that's it for this week. Don't forget to check out my website, www.norfolk-honey.co.uk and for my latest videos and podcasts with more updates, tips and techniques, it's the same Patreon page, www.patreon.com forward slash Norfolk Honey. And remember, I'm Stuart Spinks and that was beekeeping short and sweet. Bye.